to Matthew and thank you everyone who is uh, who's shown up for this and participating. Um, is my screen showing up okay? All right. Whoops. There we go. Um, I should probably begin by sort of just introducing the impetus for the project and the underlying logic behind it before I get into the specifics. Um, for those of us who work in maritime archaeology, we're all quite well aware that the field itself is sort of constantly undergoing a process of reinvention. Um, that evolving technology is constantly changing the way that we go about locating finds and sites, excavating those sites, recording and analyzing data, and disseminating our research. Um, you know, remote uh, remote operating vehicles, uh, automated underwater vehicles, long range automated underwater vehicles, underwater LIDAR, you name it. Um, technology is constantly changing the way that we go about our business and it's a it's an ongoing learning process. At the same time, um, the field itself is is relatively young. Um, the first sort of theoretically under like modern underwater excavation dates only about about back to 1960. And so every single new excavation adds substantially to our body of knowledge. And so sometimes it feels as if we're undergoing a paradigm shift on a virtually weekly basis. Um, the, the project I have right now was sort of conceived as a way of taking advantage of two different contributions to, to underwater archaeology. The first, on the one hand, uh, taking advantage of emergent technologies, in this case, um, geospatial data and GIS, and on the second hand, leveraging some new discoveries that are products of ongoing field work. Um, one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to be able to use, thank you, thanks very much to the generosity of Dr. Harpster, has been uh, the database created under the auspices of the Kudar um, Ancient Maritime Database Project, which is gathering shipwreck data in and using it to create a geospatial database for the purposes of analysis. Matthew was very kind enough to share pretty much all of his data with me, uh, and I've been trying to work with that in order to, uh, as part of this project. The aspect, the other aspect of the project, well, and here you can see sort of a, what a for a recent explanation of the, of the model that he's using, there's an article in the Journal of Archaeological Science that describes it in, in some detail, um, basically, the idea is that he's taken what I think is a, a really sort of clever and elegantly simple approach to modeling maritime activity and connectivity by creating a polygon for each and every shipwreck site or wreck site. In, on the left, you can see sort of just an example of a polygon. The red is the Kala Kulip or Kulip 4, um, a Roman era wreck. And then the other points of the polygon are sources for items identifiable in the cargo. And once you gather all of, you know, you get a sufficient number of the polygons using a GIS platform, you can take all of those polygons, overlay them upon one another, and then create all of these overlapping polygons. And by using them, then you can calculate the series, the sections in which they overlap, and by doing so, create imaging and modeling, demonstrating visually the areas in the Mediterranean which show the greatest degree of maritime connectivity. The other component of the project is um, recent discoveries identifying and chronicling uh, several different sewn boat traditions in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's really only been really 30 years since definitively the excavations at the Place Jules in Marseille under the auspices of the late Patrice Pomay definitively established the, and conclusively established and put an end to the debate of whether or not uh, Greek shipbuilding, early Greek shipbuilding used sewn plank technology. Um, but since that time, we've 
uh, been fortunate enough to be the beneficiaries of some wonderful work by various uh, maritime archaeologists demonstrating the existence of two other regional shipbuilding traditions using so, uh, sewn or la uh, lacing or lashing to attach architectural members in, uh, in ships, one in the Northern Adriatic and the other in the Northwest Mediterranean. And you can see on the, the diagram on the map there, the red squares are the Greek wrecks that are identifiable as sewn boats. The blue in the Northwest Mediterranean are, are part of this Northwest Mediterranean tradition, and then the yellow in the Northern Adriatic. Um, the brilliant uh, Julia Boretto and the late Patrice Pomey recently produced an article in the IGNA, actually, if you're curious about this, um, outlining the sort of current state of scholarship and our level of knowledge of, uh, of these three different traditions. Uh, and it's, I'm certainly relying very heavily on, on their work as well. Uh, so I want to take a look at, I don't want to dive too deeply into sort of technical details about each different tradition, and that might be chasing rabbits down rabbit holes a little too far. Um, but and then nevertheless, I think it's important to, to lay out some of the sort of more salient characteristics of these three different definitions. And ultimately, the idea of the project is to take these different shipbuilding traditions in the, and put them within the background or even in the context of the maritime connectivity modeling that we get from the Kudar uh, ancient Mediterranean database to try and ask questions about how did these regional shipbuilding traditions develop? How did they evolve or did they evolve? Uh, how did they persist within the context of what we know is clearly a, a, a rapidly expanding, increasingly complex um, maritime, uh, maritime trade in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, so the Greek sewn boat tradition has been, as I said, fairly well established since the work of Patrice Pomé in uh, the 1990s. Uh, it uses some very characteristic, easily identifiable features, including um, the tetrahedral notches and a characteristic sewing pattern to attach the strakes to one another. Um, these images are from the Calisendi Sens in uh, Mallorca, on the north coast of Mallorca. You can see the tetrahedral notches. On the left, you can see more or less uh, the wadding over the seams and the stitching to hold it in place. Uh, this is an axon axonomic, axonometric reconstruction of the Calisendi sense. Uh, and even though the first identifiable wreck that we have is the, the Gilio wreck dated to the early sixth century, it's pretty clear that even by this time, what we see is, is the existence of a very well-established uh, long running, uh, sort of, we find it in sort of in media race as it were of this shipbuilding tradition because all of these sort of features tend to work complementary to one another, and it's simply impossible to believe that they would have sprung up simultaneously without without a sort of an extended period of development. So I think we can we can backdate the period of development for the Greek shipbuilding tradition well back into the seventh and maybe earlier, well earlier. Uh, and here's just a, a brief list of, of some of the characteristic features. Um, just, and, and it's a, it's actually a quite coherent, cohesive tradition that's easily identifiable by these characteristics. Um, and beginning roughly in the in the middle of the sixth century, right around 550, with the uh, Pavich Bornu, uh, we see this shift from about 550 to an abandonment of sewn plank technology to an adoption of a Phoenician type of construction using pegged mortises and tenons to attach the strakes to one another, uh, a process that, that was ultimately completed at least by at least 300 uh, evident in the Karenia wreck. The whole process by which that happens is sort of a topic for another discussion. Uh, so I'll move on from there. The other, well, the second regional tradition I wanna talk about is the what we call a Phoenician influence um, that begins with the Mazaron one and the Mazaron two at the end of the seventh, maybe the first part of the sixth century BCE, and continues well into the third century CE, well into the imperial period. Um, the earliest examples 
are, as I said, the Mathadron 1 and the Mathadron 2, which use a kind of, which use peg mortises and tenons to attach the straights to one another, but uh, lashings to attach the frames to the hull. Uh, and you can see some images there. Uh, and so again, is that those are from about 620 to maybe 580, 570. Um, it appears to be the case that this tradition uh, uh, evident in the Mathuron 1 and the Mathuron 2 is a kind of, we, the general consensus is that it represents a kind of hybridization, a kind of local adoption of Phoenician Morris and Tenon construction in local applications, especially, and it sort of makes sense, of course, because we know that that the Phoenicians and Carthaginians had a long, or had a long and lengthy uh, presence in commercial activity in southern Spain from roughly at least uh, uh, the ninth century BCE. Uh, from there, we can move to the Benisafuyer wreck, which is in the southern shore of Menorca. Uh, it does not entirely resemble the Mataron one and the Mataron two, but it's generally thought to be an inheritor of that tradition. Um, it's it uses peg mortises and tenons also to attach the strakes to one another, but a system of lashings to attach the frames to the hull. It's a slightly different form of, of lashing where it's a kind of an external lashing where the laces penetrate to the outside of the hull. Um, but nevertheless, the, the similarities I think are, are quite clear between that and the, the Mazaron one and two. From there, uh, we see in the Northwest Mediterranean uh, what we what we have what we're identifying and what Homé and Boedo call a Northwest Mediterranean tradition. Uh, I'm calling it a, a, a Phoenician influence, um, in, in large part thanks to the work of a good friend and colleague, Carlos de Juan, who has argued, I think, quite persuasively that we have to regard this particular form of shipbuilding. As, a, as an inheritor of the, the tradition observable in the Mataron 1 and 2 and the Bini Safuya wreck. However, there's, a, there's an innovation that rather than external lashings in the Northwest Mediterranean sewn boat tradition, they use what they call what we call internal lashings, which is a system of alternating lashings fixed with trunnels, alternating with a single trunnel and then lashings again you can see some of the diagrams here. Um, on the top, there is a sort of a axonometric representation of the alternating trunnels and the lashings. And they're, they're fixed with, as I said, the lashings fixed with trunnels and then the holes covered with, uh, or the, actually the channels covered with pitch. And then the bottom is simply just a, a representation of the difference between an external lashing and an internal lashing. Um, and then finally, the third tradition that, that I'm examining and putting in the context of, of maritime connectivity um, is a Northern Adriatic sewn boat tradition. Uh, Pome and Boedo, probably mostly Boedo, uh, argue that there are three separate identifiable traditions in this region. Uh, Claude Bertram says that it, they're not different enough to be considered uh, different traditions. I think that's sort of a classic case of splitter versus joiner. I lean more towards Boeto's interpretation, however, uh, regardless. Um, uh, there's uh, what she regards as one of the one of the separate traditions is what she calls an Eastro Liburnian uh, sewn boat tradition, which is the uh, certainly first visible in the Zambratesia wreck, um, and which is the oldest planked boat found underwater in the Mediterranean, datable to the early, the late Bronze Age or perhaps the early Iron Age, somewhere between 1125 and 900 BCE. What's interesting about, well, one of the things that I find interesting about this particular tradition is how remarkably stable this tradition is. If you look uh, on the, the picture on the top right, the first diagram, stitching diagram, is the Zambratesia, again, datable to uh, 1125 to 900, uh, B and C are the Pula 2 and the Pula 1, who are both Roman imperial wrecks. And yet it's quite clear that they belong to the same tradition and the, very little modification, very little evolution, very little 
um, innovation, very consistent, very stable tradition over a really extended period, well over a millennium. Um, also, I guess sort of these are the some examples of the the Northwest Adriatic zone boats, which Boeto regards as belonging to the same general umbrella, but a slightly different family, or maybe a slightly different architectural signature, depending on the terminology you want to use. Uh, on the top is a Kamakio, it's the Kamakio wreck, um, and the bottom is the Stella One. They're, all of these Northwest Adriatic boats are characterized by uh, flat bottom hulls. Uh, they have either a plank keel or no keel at all, um, but they do exhibit some internal variation. Uh, on the Komakio on top, you can actually see, I think, pretty clearly what seems to be echoes of the Greek shipbuilding tradition and the stitching pattern and the lashings of the frames to the hull. On the bottom, you actually see in the Stella One a kind of mixed construction where the planks on the flat bottom are, are held with stitching, but once you get to the turn of the bilge, the strakes attached are stacked to each other with peg mortise and tenons. Um, so that's sort of just a brief review of the, the, the different uh, shipbuilding traditions. So now I wanted to sort of put these in the, in the context of uh, maritime connectivities. Uh, at first, I want to take a look at sort of the distribution patterns that are evident in the sort of technology and the, and the data that, that Matthew was, thank, was generous enough to let me use. I do want to just maybe as a brief aside, say that I'm very self-consciously avoiding the term networks. Uh, I am preferring to use the term connectivities and connections, just because I think um, within maritime archaeology, one of the things that we've seen is all too often a tendency to use networks and the vocabulary of network analysis rather carelessly. Network analysis is its own fully developed field of inquiry with its own coherent methodology. Uh, and I think a lot of times in maritime, I mean, not to say that there aren't people in maritime archaeology really using network analysis, but I think that there's been all too often a, a tendency to use the terminology of network analysis without actually using the principles. And so I don't want to pretend to be a network analysis. That's an analyst. It's not what I do. Um, anyway, so taking the, the data from the AMD, the Ancient Maritime Database, just run a quick, run really quickly through the period under question. On the top, you can see, uh, these are all broken down by century. Um, on the top, you can see uh, just some, some trends observable in the data. In the sixth century, pretty clearly connections between uh, say mainland Greece and uh, probably the Bay of Naples, as well as Etruria and, and central Italy. Also uh, Northern Africa, along with Sardinia and Corsica and, and Etruria and central Italy, obviously the, the result of, of uh, Carthaginian economic and maritime trade during this period. Moving to the fifth century, we see still, I think some, uh, some activity from Carthage uh, maybe also some from the Levant with uh, with the Phoenicians, uh, and then a, a, a really a fairly intense node of or area of connectivity representing, I think, a, a pretty strong connection between mainland Greece and Magna Graecia, the Greek colonies in Magna Graecia. And then as we get to the fourth century uh, BCE, we see sort of increased connections between Greece and central Italy, um, as well as uh, Tunisia or Carthage, as well as uh, some uh, production from sort of farther east or sort of farther west in North Africa, but really the entire Western Mediterranean becoming a much more integrated area of connectivity with also Sicily playing, I, I think, a pretty major role. If we move to the third to the first century BC, and I just maybe I should just point out, I, the, the color difference here uh, in between some of these is I made some of these maps using ArcGIS Pro and some of these using ArcMap. And for whatever reason, the color scheme, the graduated color schemes in one are not available in the other. So that's just, that's the only reason for the color differences there. Anyway, uh, in the third century BC, uh, we're seeing 
I think what we kind of expect to see, still some activity on North Africa and connecting with uh, Central Italy, Sardinia, uh, Sardinia and Corsica with um, Carthaginian activity. But of course, the increasing role and increasing domination of Central Italy and Rome uh, in the maritime activity of the Mediterranean. And this trend actually continues, obviously, in the second century BC and well in, and then of course, picks up even more in the first century BC. But what I find really interesting here and what I didn't expect is that if you look at the first century BCE, um, really a, a kind of intensification of maritime activity in the Northern Adriatic. And we'll pick, I'll pick up on that uh, in, in a little bit later. Uh, as we get into the sort of the turn of the, of the common era, we see once again, something that we probably should already expect, um, a really growing level of participation in maritime activities stemming from the hugely productive uh, agricultural centers and mining and mines of Southern Spain. Uh, a lot of activity and connection between sort of Northeast Spain with Turaco and the wine production centers uh, in Terracanensis uh, Ter 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 wine. Um, and so the, the Western Mediterranean being sort of this hub now involving the Iberian Peninsula. That continues well into the, the second century BCE, or second century CE, excuse me. Uh, and then in the third century CE, we see uh, a phenomenon with which I think most historians or Roman historians are well familiar, namely uh, the, cri the, the sort of evidence of the crisis of the third century, where the production uh, coming out of southern Spain begins to decline precipitously, and North Africa becomes this hugely important production center where we see all the distribution of, of African red slip pottery, African olive oil, um, and it's the, the point at which we see all of these African goods being spread throughout the Mediterranean. Heading into late antiquity uh, in the fourth century, again, sort of these patterns are not all that surprising. Uh, we see the continued dominance of North African maritime activity in the fourth century. Uh, into the fifth century, we see still very powerful economic activity in the Western Mediterranean centering in North Africa, but an overall shrinking of the of the pie, as it were, and a, a rise in maritime activity connected with the Levant. Uh, and then as we go into the sixth century, really we see the sort of the rise of the East after the fall of Rome uh, to the Gallic invasions in the late fifth century. Um, I also wanted to take the data, one of the other ways that I'm exploring the data from the ancient maritime database uh, that I've taken, I've taken just the actual points of the polygons instead of the areas of overlap in order to try and pay more close attention to the, the areas that produced the goods that are found in the shipwreck cargoes in order to try and understand production in, 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 uh, in juxtaposition with the regions or the patterns of distribution. Uh, and so we're running through basically the same period. In this case, there are some heat maps of the production centers. Sixth century, again, not shocking. Uh, Carthage, or sorry, in this case, the Phoenicians, not Carthage. Um, some, in, some early in Tunis, but mostly the Phoenician activity in the Levant. Uh, in the fifth century, still a lot of Levantine production but growing production in, in Greece and the Greek mainland. And then by the fourth century BC, we see a real step up, a real increase in production, both in, in Greece and the Aegean, uh, especially Crete, uh, and also rising levels of production in central Italy, probably Etruria. As we move into the third to the first, we see that pattern largely continuing, but intens intensifying. Less production in Levant, certainly big, big levels of production in both Lazio, uh, in Latium, and in Etruria, as well as continuing production in Greece and Crete. And then, of course, the pattern develops as we would expect, declining levels of production in, uh, in, in the east, in the Aegean, and really a sort of a dominant role played by central Italy 
And then by the first century BCE, I think we see really a sort of a confirmation of, of the, the, the modeling in the distribution patterns and the maritime connections that we see again, these the, a sort of a, a separate sphere of production on the Adriatic coast of Italy, sort of corresponding to that level of, of, of shipping maritime activity in the Adriatic. And as again, as I said, we'll pick up that theme a little bit towards the end. As we get into the turn of the common era, again, a lot of these patterns are sort of echoes of what we already saw, the, um, the declining role of central Italy and the increasing role of production centers in Taraco in the northeast coast of Spain, and then Bedica in the southern uh, in southern Spain. But still, once again, in the in the first century CE, we still see northern Italy, but also the Adriatic coast of Italy as a site of production. Uh, as we go into the second century, uh, declining production in southern Spain, but still significant levels, um, and of course, growing production in North Africa. Um, a trend which continues into the third century CE, as we can see, where North Africa, again, becomes this, this really hugely important seminal area of production for the rest of the Mediterranean. As we get into late antiquity, we see, again, the same basic pattern, but this time relative to production. North Africa, across the entire region of sort of what's modern, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, um, these, these huge levels of production from North Africa um, that starts to decline in the, in the 5th century CE, um, increasing production in, in, in the East, and Italy becomes essentially uh, a, a consumer, a region of consumerism, if, if, a major, if not really even a major player in the economy of the Mediterranean at all. And then by the 6th century CE, we see uh, the East dominating once again. So what does all this actually mean? Like how do we actually, or how am I tying in these patterns of shipbuilding development with these economic patterns observable in the data modeling? Um, well, first of all, I think the, the basic takeaways are that um, we see, as, uh, as, as I think are pretty clear, a pretty consistent picture represented by the by both examining production and maritime connectivity, which is kind of nice, at least in the sense that it provides some reassurance that we're not seeing some really wonky, wonky data. Also, that the overall picture or pattern of developments are pretty consistent. What we already know about the general historical trends, which again is also I think pretty reassuring. Um, in terms of the reliability of the data, that it, they we're not seeing anything that that really stands out as particularly anomalous, uh, and it increases, I think, the level of trust that we can have in the data and the data modeling. We see the early activity of Carthage and, uh, sorry, Phoenician, particularly Phoenicians, uh, in the east, and Greek colonization in the in the in the Western Mediterranean, moving on to the domination of Rome, and then the rising uh, the rising importance of North Africa in late antiquity. A couple of things that I, I find notable, however, and which one of which is I've already pointed out, is the the level of activity, both in terms of maritime connectivity and productivity in the Adriatic, which was not something that I, I really anticipated. Um, and probably more than anything else, just a gentle reminder of how important North Africa was to the overall economy of the Mediterranean, both in the early periods and in late antiquity, um, I don't think it's unfair to say that the as much as we still like to to talk about, or as much as we like to talk about, sort of expanding the Greco-Roman paradigm in, in terms of looking at the ancient Mediterranean, we're still very much working within that tradition, and it's good to just continually to be reminded that we need to to think about areas like the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa that were hugely important, in fact, absolutely essential to the maritime activity in the region that often get overlooked because we, can, we think of them as Roman. Um, so but anyway, sort of to try and go back and revisit the sewn boat traditions, in this case, what I did is I took the, the numbers of wrecks and put a, plotted them according to the time series data um, as, a, as a way of trying to compare the patterns of development in distribution and production observable in the in the visual modeling 
And then again, sort of juxtaposing that with these developments and, and regional shipbuilding traditions. Um, on the, the red line is, is the, the, um, the Greek shipbuilding tradition, which of course, as I said, in the sixth century BC, BCE begins to, to, to essentially be phased out in, in the adoption of mortise and tenon technology. And then we see these really big peaks uh, in the first century BC, first century AD, between the two regional tr uh, traditions in the Northwest Mediterranean and the Northern Adriatic. What I found sort of fascinating as more I dig into it was first of all, to look at the early development of both of these traditions. As I said, the, the Northern Adriatic is, is the oldest uh, identifiable tradition of, of sewn plank or sort of, of planked boats in the Mediterranean. But we can also see in the blue line, the Punic influence, those are the examples of the Mataron I, the Mataron II, and the Bini Safuyer, sort of this period of evolution and development that ends up peaking in uh, the late Republic and early empire with the, the sort of internally lashed frames of the Punic influenced Northwest Mediterranean tradition. Um, in addition, I was also sort of fascinated to see the uh, on the in the in the wake of the peak of the the northern Adriatic tradition, it didn't just fall away. In the case of the Greek tradition as well as the Northwest Mediterranean tradition, once they decline, they both just disappear. They seem to be phased out in favor of what is an admittedly technologically superior Morris and Tenon joinery. But in the northern Adriatic, we see the persistence of this. Of, of this tradition, even though it declines in overall numbers, it continues well into the medieval period. Now, some of this shouldn't come as a huge surprise. If we plot on top of this, this is a sort of an example of, of Parker's 1992 graph um, showing the, the overall numbers of shipwrecks by, by century. Uh, it's a, even though it's you know a 30 year old graph, it's the, the basic outlines have still held true with additional discoveries. Um, what's interesting is I think we see very different responses to the economic pressures of this increasingly robust and complex uh, maritime connectivity in the Mediterranean. In the case of the Greek tradition, economic pressures seem to have forced out sewn plank technology. But in the case of the Northwest Mediterranean and the Northern Adriatic, instead of, re instead of abandoning the technology, they retain it and just bump up levels of production. So what are we supposed to make of all this? Well, again, as I said, in the, in the Greek tradition, we see this clear process of transition from the sixth to fourth century. In the Ibero-Punic tradition, we see this period of evolution, rapid peak, rapid disappearance. Um, in the Northern Adriatic, we see very a very lengthy, very static tradition in terms of the technology but in a, a sharp increase in numbers in the late Republic, early, early empire, but really a maintained tradition, a coherent tradition that maintains from roughly the late Bronze Age into the medieval period, a really extraordinary uh, stable technology. Uh, so what do we, how do we make sense of, of these developmental patterns? Um, to be frank, I was more familiar with the Greek tradition. It formed a big part of my, my dissertation. And I kind of expected the other regional traditions, uh, traditions to follow more or less the same pattern, which was essentially that the sewn plank tradition was older. Um, when faced with increasing pressures for more boats and bigger boats and greater cargoes, that we would see the abandonment of the sewn plank technology in the face of these economic pressures. But obviously, as we just seen, as anything but the case in the two different regional traditions. And so had to revise the thesis. Uh, and clearly it's the case that changing traditions, the different traditions are responding in very different ways to, to these factors. And we have to consider the reality of different factors uh, applicable to each different tradition. Um, so in the case, I mean, uh, sort of just a, a quick, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna run through some various hypotheses that have been proposed. Uh, each one of it has its own limitations and its own problems. 
Um, the first hypothesis, which was mine, was that uh, economic forces and increasing pressure, economic pressures by increasing levels of maritime trade would have caused the sewn plank technologies to disappear. As we've seen, that actually does explain quite well uh, the disappearance of the Greek sewn plank tradition, but it doesn't explain at all the Northwest Mediterranean and Northern Adriatic traditions. Um, we could resort to the explanation of say path dependence. Uh, and that I think works if we're looking at the Northwest Mediterranean and the Northern Adriatic, but it certainly doesn't work to explain the Greek tradition, which completely abandons one lengthy developed, highly coherent tradition in favor of another technology. Um, other people have also talked about the observable and widely accepted and widely, widely observed ethnographic tendency of shipbuilders towards pronounced conservatism, which sort of makes sense. If you're taking to the sea, new and improved is not what you wanna hear. You want tried and true, tested. It's the kind of technology that your dad, that, you, that enabled your dad to go to the sea and come back home, his dad to go to the sea and come back home. Um, and that I think works well for, certainly for the Eastro Liburnian boats, which are clearly uh, incredibly stable as I've already said, but it doesn't really help explain uh, certainly the Greek tradition, which, which adopts an entirely new technology, uh, the, North, the Northwest Adriatic, which shows influences of Greek shipbuilding and a certain level of experimentation and innovation and not for the Northwest Mediterranean, which as, as we've seen, has a sort of evolving tradition. Um, and it was a, essentially a hybrid technology from the very outset and is much more open to innovation and experimentation. Now, Beltran and Gotti actually say, well, the sewn boat construction is cheaper and simpler for smaller boats. And so that's why we retain these regional traditions. Again, that only works for some and not for others. It works for the Northern Adriatic boats. Um, but it doesn't explain the Northwest Mediterranean or really anywhere else for that matter. Um, and so it becomes problematic if we want to use that. Uh, Sabrina Marlier uh, has a very interesting argument in which, has, in which she poses that the Adriatic was a more or less sort of closed space uh, navigationally. And that sort of led to a kind of insular, insulated space which preserved um, the traditional ship construction. However, that I think faces other challenges, the kind of mixed influence or the Greek influence on Northwest Adriatic boats, the kind of uh, experimentation or variety of Northwest Adriatic. And it's also, as we've seen with the data modeling, it doesn't stand up to the evidence in the data modeling, which show those intense levels of maritime activity and production in the Adriatic during the imperial period. Uh, still more hypotheses. Um, in general, I would say I'm usually reluctant to resort to culture as an explanation. Uh, I think more often than not, when archaeologists can't explain something, we tend to fall back on culture as a sort of intellectually lazy explanatory model. And like, we can't figure out anything else, so it must be culture. Um, whether it's a tradition or whether it's an identity marker or openness to innovation. Um, in this case, however, I think that there are some indications that that actually might be um, a, a reasonable, at least not a, it doesn't necessarily explain everything, but at least a, a reasonable consideration. And in, in, in this, I think that Westerdahl's model of the maritime cultural landscape is an especially helpful approach to try and understand what's going on. Um, this is, of course, an approach that has been advocated not only by Pome and Boeto, as well as by, by, by Matthew Harpster um, and, and Marlier, but others. And I think the advantage of the maritime cultural landscape concept is it allows us to, to seek a more nuanced, more complex approach that allows us to take in various factors and incorporate them, not just economic forces, not just geographic factors, not just um, environmental or cultural factors, but a combination of all of them working together to create sort of unique combinations. And I think that's that's the model that seems to help most in, in this particular examination. 
And so I think ultimately what we're left to conclude is, is that we have, to, we have to, to come to the conclusion that each different tradition was affected in its own unique way and developed in its own path and its own sort of linear path or developmental path based on divergent factors that were unique to each tradition. In the case of the Greek tradition, as I've written elsewhere, I think the economic factors and pressures of increased maritime trade absolutely explain the abandonment of the stone plank in favor of the Peg Morris and Tenon tradition. Um, I don't, I mean, it's, it, here's not the, not the place to go into a blow by blow, detail by detail explanation, but I, I think that that model still absolutely holds true. Um, in the Northwest Mediterranean, I think we clearly see, as I've said, from the very beginning, a kind of receptivity to evolution and innovation and experimentation, um, but also influences of geography. One of the things that we've seen that we see in the, the area in which the Northwest Mediterranean boats are most prevalent is coastlines in which there's a lot of shallow, shallow water ports, a lot of riverine uh, navigation. And so a sort of maritime, fluvial maritime kind of, of transport. Uh, and we see this also in, in many of the Northwest Mediterranean boats that are very flat bottomed, clearly intended to navigate uh, to, through a riverine navigation. Uh, and in the Northern Adriatic, much of the same kind of geographic conditions, not a whole lot of deep water harbors, a lot of uh, riverine and lacustrine um, navigation, as well as I think, as opposed to the Northwest Mediterranean, uh, a much greater degree of ethnographic conservatism. Um, now, I should say that, I mean, this project is, is not in any way complete. I'm still in the process of working on it. Uh, I'm looking at different ways to model the data. I'm adding data to the database in order to, to create um, the ability to customize uh, date ranges, which I think will, will help look at some of the periods of more intense activity so that we can look at something like the first century CE, which is this you know, period of really explosive growth and break it down into sort of smaller periods of time to see whether or not there's differences between the first half of the century and the second half, or the first quarter and the second quarter. Uh, I also think it would be helpful in some sense to try and run the data through a network analysis software platform like Gephi or something like that to try and visualize the kinds of connections in a, in a sort of a more overt way, the levels of connectivity, and to really sort of establish more maybe some regional connections. Um, I should also say that there have been some challenges with this project, some of which are anticipatable and foreseeable, and some of which I, I think it comes to me with a surprise. Um, certainly working with a database that somebody else has curated is always difficult because their organizational principles are not necessarily yours. Um, I will also say that a bit of some of the challenges have been a kind of illustration of the Dunning-Kruger effect. I am not an expert in graphic information software. Uh, I'm familiar with it. Uh, probably just familiar enough to overestimate my own abilities to work with it. Uh, and so it has been a bit of a learning curve just in using the software and uh, processing the data. Um, that all being said, uh, I, I, I want to sort of leave with some of the sort of big picture takeaways. Um, and these are not especially controversial, but I think illustrated by the data, first of all, that the efficiency postulate is often overstated. The kind of build a better mousetrap notion that more efficient, uh, more advantageous, improved technology should always replace more outdated, less efficient technology is really not the way that the world works. And in fact, those of us who live in a region of the world that still measures distance in feet, yards, and miles, and volume in cups, pints, quarts, and gallons know very well that efficiency doesn't necessarily always mean that we're going to adopt the new approach. Secondly, I think it's, it's tempting to always look for monocausal explanations, and I myself am an example of falling into that trap, but the reality is that in the ancient world, in archaeology, the explanation is almost always much more complicated than we tend to believe. And sometimes it's a function of the lacunary nature of the archaeological evidence that it presents itself as sometimes being soluble through a monocausal approach, uh, 
but I think we need to sort of remind ourselves. So these are some of these lessons that I think we kind of continually need to remind ourselves that we need to constantly be on the lookout for more nuanced, more complex uh, explanations. Uh, and finally, that arch we're well, not finally, but second to last, maybe pen penultimately, um, archaeology often tells us what happened, but sometimes it's a difficult process in trying to figure out how it happened or especially why it happened. And then finally, um, the importance of continued research. Um, you know, putting together a picture of the ancient maritime world in the Mediterranean um, is a process much like trying to put a puzzle together where you've got a 500 piece puzzle and you've got about seven pieces to put it together with, no cover of the box and no corner pieces. Uh, and so we, we need to continually sort of kind of continue to do work to fill in those gaps um, and continue to excavate, continue to publish and continue to do research. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and your and your attention, and I want to thank all of the the people who contributed to putting this together. All right. There's that echo. Can you turn down your volume, Elif? How can you ice? Okay, excellent. Well, um, oh, sorry, unfortunately, we're not all here in person, okay. but if we were, we'd all be applauding and thanking Paul for his lecture. Extraordinarily thorough and extraordinarily detailed, and I really, really appreciate it. Now, we have some time for some questions. I have a couple of my own, but the best thing to do we've learned in this environment is if you have questions, please write them in the chat, mm. and then I can relay them to Paul, because... What we found in the past is that if people are trying to raise their hand, it's difficult for Aleph or I to actually see you. But if you put something in the chat, we will see it and we can relay it on. So if are there any questions coming up? Would any, any questions for Paul right now? Okay. Well, I've got one actually. I mean, you mentioned at the end of your talk how clearly with all archaeological work, we need to keep investigating, finding more data, keep looking around. And with your work, I mean, where do you think we should be going next with this kind of research? Is it an issue of refining our methods or is it an issue of finding more data? What do you think would be more valuable? That's a great question. Um, that's a, it's a great question. Did you, can you hand me? Am I am I audible? No audible. I still can't hear you. That's your problem. Alcibiade says he can hear me. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know yeah, what to. I I, okay. Um, as far as like refining the methodology, uh, you know, there's, first of all, I don't know necessarily how to answer that, just because I think innovations in and and advances in, in methodology are usually sort of unanticipated. Uh, and so I'm not really, I, I, don't, I don't know, it seems like sort of a crystal ball kind of question. Yeah, very um, much but, so. but also I think it, it, the, the flip side of that too, there, there is an aspect of that that is um, I think more concrete and that's just the sort of financial resources. I think when we see ex underwater excavations um, when we're able to sort of fully excavate and and actually remove whole remains and study them in a laboratory setting, what we find are our levels of detail and kind of shades of of uh, of nuances or nuances that are just not observable in C2, even if we clear off the entire cargo and and examine a, a wreck in detail, there are just certain things that we find when we're able to sort of take the take the architectural members and you know break them apart and turn them over. I mean the Karenia wreck I think is probably the best example. Um, but some of that is obviously constrained by financial, by financial considerations. It's just it's such an expensive, labor intensive process. I would love to see it done more often, but um, as far as the adding data, I mean obviously the more data that we have is always is always beneficial. Um, certainly for some of the periods that we have in, in, in question that I, that I looked at, 
in this just in this project you know we're dealing with some pretty small sample sizes and it would be nice to have to have significantly more than that and so yeah just just keep excavating i guess is is one i mean it's it may be a sort of a bland pablum explanation but uh the, the more we have the the better off and again i just think even just the material that we're that we're able to look at you know it was again it was only 30 years ago that we definitively put to rest the question of whether or not the greeks even built boats with lacing mm. um and then you know the 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 northwest mediterranean and northern adriatic traditions are really only i mean the scholarship on that is you know less than two decades old who knows what we're going to find with with continued excavation um, in other parts of the Mediterranean? Yeah, those are all good points. Uh, now, a number of people have written in with some questions. Uh, Alif actually wrote first. She uh, the nature like wood species. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's those are all really interesting. I think the. Um, I, I don't. I, I, if I if I understand the question, is it does the do the species of wood? Yeah. Okay. So dictate the nature of construction. I don't think normally it's the case. Um, uh, in, in some instances, probably if you're dealing with a region that's really limited geographically, um, but for the most part, there like in ship construction, you usually see certain elements of a wooden vessel that use hardwoods and then some that use sort of cheaper and more easily accessible softwoods like planking is usually it's like pine or some other sort of or you know ash or some other kind of softwood whereas you know keels and sometimes frames are are hardwoods but throughout the mediterranean you're there, there's no region really in the mediterranean where you can't find some species of hardwood and some species of softwood um, and so it's, you really don't necessarily see that. You see different species, yes, that I think the speciation or species analysis, I think, is much more helpful in trying to determine locus of production, where shipyards and things like that, which, of course, when you find a ship sunk in underwater, the fine spot can often be well, you know, far afield from the place where it was actually built. So the species analysis, I think, much more much more insightful for actually trying to identify places of production, which of course at you know different loci, different loci of production often are correlated with different um, shipbuilding architectural signatures and architectural families, but they're not actually dictated by the the the, the species. If that answers the question, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I can think of one example. There was a story that after we have the arrival of Islam and the Arabs into the Mediterranean in the seventh century. They had this kind of local myth that the water in the Mediterranean was different than the water in the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean. And so as a result, they thought they had to build the ships in a different way. But yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, but I mean, that's just something coming through like the preserved written tradition. I don't know if it was ever actually manifested. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, my my understanding of the of the of the of the evidence is that I, I haven't seen anything that suggests that the ability to locate different kinds of wood changes mm -hmm. the the construction method. I mean, we do have plenty of references of how far afield um shipbuilders would would go for especially for masts the mm -hmm. wood for the trees used for mast was incredibly important and we have we even have references in homer uh in the iliad and the odyssey where they where homer talks about like you have to go like there's there's you know people whose job it is you know woodcutters going way up into the hills just to locate the right kind of tree to build a mast um, I think that becomes actually, honestly, I think it becomes less of a problem. I think Russell Miggs has a great book on trees and timber in the ancient world, and he addresses all of these sort of questions. I think it becomes less of an issue when we get into sort of the sort of the Hellenistic and Republican periods and, and for further on as the sort of maritime 
trade and the connectivity in the Mediterranean becomes so much more complex and so much more robust that the ability to, to obtain materials from pretty much anywhere throughout the Mediterranean and even beyond with the, you know, the Silk Road is, is so, it, 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 it's on what, I mean, the kinds of cargoes, the size of cargoes, the level of transport really would not be equaled uh, for another maybe 1500 years mm -hmm. um, by what we see in sort of the first century BCE, first century CE. And so obtaining different species of wood was not really that much of a logistical challenge. If you had the money, you could get it. Yeah, entirely. I agree. And you see the other questions rather than me reading yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Nancy Lenlin says, were cargoes moved from one kind of boat, say a smaller one, uh, to another one for longer? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I didn't really, I mean, I, I, I again, sort of, there's always decisions to be made in a presentation of this. This is about to, it. I, I sort of, it's a challenge to sort of take a project of this size into a, a presentation like this. Um, but yes, one of the, we have absolutely clear evidence that what we see in the ancient Mediterranean are, are sort of multi-level distribution networks and, and, and transportation and uh, networks where you see some, sh like certain ships, like big, uh, big cargo, big, uh, big ships without oars, just sail driven ships, transporting really huge amounts of, of goods from one point, from one point of embarkation to one destination, um, across large expanses of open ocean. Then you see sort of, sort of trans-regional, then you see sort of regional connectivity where, uh, something like the Kalasami Sense, for example, even as early as the late sixth century seems to have like a circuit where it goes from back and forth from like Southern Italy to the Northern coast of Spain and Southern coast of France in between back and forth, hitting maybe three or four different ports. Then we see smaller boats like the Bon Porte or others that have really heterogeneous cargoes where they're clearly doing what the, the, the sort of fancy term for it is cabotage, this kind of coastal hugging where it's stopping at every single little port along the way you know, picking up a couple of things and dropping off a couple of things and at each port doing that. Um, and I think probably the best illustration of the way that that works is actually at the Roman port of, of, of Ostia, where obviously these big ships could not possibly travel up the, uh, you know, up, up, up the Tiber River to bring goods to Rome. And so they actually built the entire port of Ostia specifically to handle some of these bigger boats and these massive port infrastructures even some of the boats that, that docked um, at Ostia, they're, the name for the boat um, that uh, Strabo uses it, um, it derived from the Greek word helka, which actually means drag. Um, and that's a name for a kind of boat that's so big, it can't actually sail into, a har into or out of a harbor. And it had to actually be pulled into and out of the harbor where it would be obviously um, offloaded and then the goods would be loaded onto either wagons or smaller boats that could go up the Tiber River. So yeah, absolutely. There's those kinds of like multi-level spheres of exchange are, are absolutely apparent throughout the Mediterranean, even from a very early period. Mm -hmm. uh, network analysis software. Well, the one that I'm, the one that I've worked with is, is Gephi. Uh, it's G-E-F-Y. It's a network analysis software that that plots and creates video, sort of abstract visual representations of of network connections. Um, there, I'm sure there's others. Again, like as as someone who's not a network in, uh, specialist in network network analysis, that's just the one that I'm familiar with. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure you could you could find others. Uh, comparisons of the situation in the Black Sea. I would love to see more. This is this is sort of going back, touching on the point of like more excavation, uh, but I just don't think we have enough data for the Black Sea. Um, you know, there's the Aurelia wreck is one that that is sort of illustrative of the Greek shipbuilding tradition. Um, that's on the southern coast of the Black Sea, and of course we know we have more than enough literary evidence to to know how important the Black Sea was uh, economically. 
uh, and productively really from a very early on, for a very early stage, of course, Athens was almost completely dependent on the Black Sea for its food supply, its grain supply. Um, but as far as, as shipwrecks, uh, you know, we haven't seen enough that are really well excavated. And I think some of it is just a, a, a sort of economic function that a lot of the cultures in, or a lot of the countries in that part of the world are, are just not as economically, in an economically advantageous enough position to be able to devote the kind of funds to it. And then of course, uh, as a sort of, uh, maybe a bit of an aside, but sort of a source of frustration is we've seen huge amounts of money spent on something like the Southampton's map project in the Black Sea doing deep water exploration, but really not producing any archeologically valuable results. It's great for them, some fascinating pictures, some really beautiful sort of coffee table stuff, um, coffee table book, that's right, not coffee tables, but you can make some great coffee table books out of the images, but from an archeological perspective, they're not really producing any data that's that's really usable or workable. Okay. Are there other questions for Paul? Okay. Well, I've got one more if I could pick sure, your brain sure. a bit. I think I don't think we ever discussed this while you were here. I can't remember. <laughs> but what always strikes me is something similar to what you mentioned just recently today. And it's that there's an obvious need to continue collecting data and to keep refining our models, so on and so forth. But what I wonder is if we can kind of predict what will happen in the future, because every as we collect more data, we find that we have to divide up our construction typology of ships into finer and finer gradations. You know, we started off with say two versions and then we mm -hmm. have more data about sewn boats. So then we got three, now we have five, soon we'll have seven. And so, I mean, what do you think the long-term result will this will be? Do you think we'll have a very detailed typology of ships? Or do you think we'll simply find that there was actually no organization to this construction in the past and people just built what they could? Uh, I would lean more towards the former than the latter of that hypothesis. Um, I think we're already sort of seeing some of the details and the outlines emerge. Um, I think where we've seen, particularly, particularly with a lot of the Roman era, Rex, the or the the Republican era and imperial stuff, because we because we have more, obviously a bigger data set that we're starting to see analyses that are able to postulate um, actual sort of specific architectural signatures that are associatable with specific like regions, and I think we may even get to the point where if we can if if we can continue to do that we might even be able to, to, to get down to the point of like discrete shipyards. Hmm. Um, I don't know if we'll ever, I, I don't know if we'll get to that point, but I, I, like, as I said, I think we're seeing sort of outlines of that. And if we can get more data, I think we will we'll continue to sort of refine those outlines. Um, I mean, kind of like the way that, that the sort of Greek pottery, painted pottery does. Where you know they can even they can even establish like a, a particular workshop or a particular you know school painted school even particular single particular hands. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't think we'll ever get to that point with with shipbuilding, especially just because it was it's such a sort of a team exercise. Um, but but yeah, I I think we're going to get to that point where we're 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 getting better and better and better at sort of clarifying refining some of these these finite distinctions okay okay i like that i'll hold you to that I'll, we'll talk <laughs> about this in 10 years and see what's happened okay yeah that's a deal write uh, it down what's that write it down i will i'll mark my calendar all right excellent now i don't see any more questions in the chat are there any other before we let paul run away and you know go play in the snow Okay. Well, then I think we've taken up enough of your time. We've certainly 
have peppered you with lots and lots of questions. Once again, I really want to thank you for coming, for your time, for volunteering all of this great information and the presentation today. Again, oh, sorry, there is actually there is one additional person. one additional question that I would uh, like I can address okay. is uh, from Genger uh, uh, yeah. that uh, Bosper's Currents blocked development of the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of that. I, I would say um, the the way that the the currents um, in the Dardanelles work, as I understand it, is that they tend to to flow south out of the Black Sea and then retreat. And so that if you're trying to go into the Black Sea, you just kind of have to wait for the appropriate currents. Um, and then if you're trying to sail from the Black Sea down into the Mediterranean, the reverse works. You, there are just certain times you have to wait for the right current before you can sort of sail one direction or the other, but it's not a kind of thing that, that actually prevents over the long haul um, any kind of any kind of development or anything like that. You actually actually even see it today. If you're actually in Istanbul, there are times when you can actually look out on the Sea of Marmara and you can see it actually sort of blanketed with these big cargo ships, just kind of sitting there parked, waiting for the right current because the current even affects those, those boats going, going up into the Black Sea even today. All right. Thanks for that last little bit. I'm glad, I'm glad you noticed that. 